Never seen him try to coffee. Yeah. Make sure you get his voice. <laughs> what do you want? Can I get an almond latte, please? Regular? Yes, please. Okay. And I'll just get a cappuccino, thank you. First off, how's the knee? I know you tore just about everything you could in that knee, so how's the, the rehab coming along? You're pretty close now. Yeah, knee's all good now, mate. I'm running. I'm in the home stretch now. It's been about seven and a half months, so I'm looking at six to seven weeks. Hopefully, I'll be back out there, and uh, we'll see how we go. How frustrating has the last seven or eight months been for you? Last two months have been actually pretty good for me, to be honest. The first four or five, four and a half, were probably the hardest. I didn't run for about 17 weeks which was obviously just, just sitting still all the time and just doing the same old tedious stuff was pretty frustrating. The last two months, though, it's been really good. Just, like, I get to build on my lows and run faster, run better, so it's been a bit of a blessing. Talk to me about the, the dark times over this period. Like, uh, I've known you a while and I've always known you to be a guy that loves, loves a drink, loves a good time. You know, you're, you're a lad's lad, but when did you kind of realise that things were maybe getting out a little bit of out of hand with the way you were handling alcohol and, and things in, in your life? Yeah, like you said, mate, I've never been um, shy of a good time. And as soon as this sort of happened, I, I just sort of... Everything on the surface seemed... I just I said what I needed to say to sort of keep everyone away. Sort of like, everything's fine, you know, I'm, I'm OK, I'm OK. And then I just, I'd go home and I'd just... Nothing was OK, you know, but I couldn't talk about it. I felt like I just didn't want to talk about it. And then I just sort of... In certain aspects, like parties and um, partying by myself and that kind of stuff, just whoever was keen, it just I just kept getting further and further down this this ladder or like you know into this darker hole, and, and then it stopped working. Like you'd party, I'd party to escape, and then it became I I just feel numb the whole time, and it just it stopped. The effect of the release would stop working, and then I realised like I was just sitting in one of myself, and everything was numb, and I just sort of lost all care factor and realised like I just was sabotaging everything I had. How scary is that? Mate, it's pretty scary. And talking about it now, it's pretty, like, it's... it's When that story hit the other week, it was, like, a bit of embarrassment as well, a bit of regret. Like, just sort of just... Mate, that time in my life was just such a weird spiral, and it's happened quick. Like, I was OK, all of a sudden I wasn't. Like, and it, like three or four months, just I blinked and it was done, you know? And I, and I was in that place where I was, like... Like, I wasn't just... I was heavily depressed. Um, and I was all I was thinking about was, like, I'm going to have a beer, like, just to get out of this place, and obviously just it just wasn't working. So how did you decide to get yourself out of that hole? Basically, the thoughts I was sitting with were pretty scary, right? Um, for myself, like, I, I, I'm not really, like, I'm a pretty happy, positive person, and then all of a sudden I was just sitting with, like, like some really, really negative, dark thoughts, and then I just thought, like, I, I can't be like this, this is not me. The scariest thing for me was asking for help, pretty much. Like, you know, you, I was judging myself more than anything else, like, um... And it was just seemed like an impossible task to ask anyone for anything. Like, and I called JD up, and I, and I was on the way to meet him, and I was shitting myself. Like, what am I doing? I'm going to turn around. I've already called him. I, I just said I need to have a chat. And I was on the way there, like dead set, shaking. Like, oh, he's going to know. Like, now he's going to know what I've been doing. That's the worst thing. Just kept driving, kept driving. As soon as I asked him, the first thing he said was, "Man, I'm really proud of you." And I was, what? Who are you talking to? Like, and I just. It, after that, it just started getting easier like, when you start talking about things. For me, um, yeah, the weight came off and it, and it all started getting a bit easier, sharing that load. So how did the decision to go to a rehabilitation centre and, and work on yourself come about? Was that something that Jason suggested, the club suggested, or together? Um, nah, I'm not sure if you know this lady. She used to work at our club. She's amazing. Her name's Jan Earl. She works behind the scenes with athletes that, you know, struggle with certain things in life, you know? And she was sort of... She was always in my corner and, I, you know, that was always an option. She sort of, like, pushed for a little bit because I've had that, you know, mixed relationship. And I was always, nah, I'm fine, like, everything's all right. And when I got to that point of, you know, almost no return, I was like, I just need something radical. And she's like, look, this is what I've always offered. And then she was like, you know, she was doing all the hard work behind the scenes and then it was always... It was already in motion. And that's when I told JD, this is what I think I need. Like, what do you think? Like, you know, like waiting for him to, you know, spray me or whatever else. Like, and then he just said, mate, yeah, I'm really proud of you. That's awesome, you know, it's a big step. And I just, like, and that's when it all started happening. So what was rehabilitation like for you? <laughs> um, it was really interesting, eh? Like, the, uh, the first few days I was a bit on edge, you know, just around strangers and stuff like that. And then, 
You know, you're sitting around a circle of chairs with with people you have no idea talking about like some of the depth of your life and like you know your darkest and like, demons and stuff like that. You know, and people crying and, and sitting around in circles. It was just the most surreal experience. And you start going to meetings and you hear people's stories about their lives and where they've come from and what they've done and. You know, just like the dark, the dark spots I've been in where they are now, it's like it's inspiring to be around. And I was just like sitting there the whole time. That's what I want. Like, this has taken so much from me. Like, you know, I had so much good, had so many good times. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, it put me in this place here, which I put myself in. But it was all, you know, part of it. I don't want that anymore. I want like I want a different, different path, different path out. Seeking treatment once you're outside of rehab, continuing to go to Alcoholics Anonymous. How important was that to continue to do, considering, you know, once people maybe get out of that environment, they stop working on themselves or they fall into old habits again? Yeah, I think the main thing that was driven in rehab was um, how often people start doing their own thing and, and get off the, the path of, you know, what they sort of advise you to do, and they just fall back into old habits really quickly and they just get back straight into it, and that was not what I wanted, so I really took advice and took it on, and, and I went to meetings probably three or four times a week every week for the first maybe six weeks. I don't go, I still go now probably once or twice a week, but I've got a bit more on my plate these days and I've got a really good balance and understanding and I still see, I do all the right things for myself and take myself out of situations that might be risky or whatever, but um, it was really important. Just um, maybe dropping the ego a little bit and realising that you know, it's okay to just follow someone else's advice instead of thinking you know it all was the biggest thing for me because, I don't know, I'm pretty driven by ego at times. And, as a man, you know, you think you know everything and no one can tell you, sh no one can tell you shit, and that was a big thing for me. Um, so that was pretty important, just to, you know, take some advice and take it on and be open. Why did you decide to talk about this publicly? It could have easily just mm. vanished into the ether and no one would have known about it. Yeah, easily, could have definitely done that. Um, I feel like... I was in such a bad place. I feel like, you know, there's a lot of people out there that would get in those places and don't have the avenues that I do and the support that I do around them to support them, you know, the way they need and, and to push them into places that, you know, I could really help them out. But now I've got, a, I've got a bit of a profile that I could maybe talk about something publicly that someone wouldn't talk about normally and I can maybe uh, set an example or I can definitely just, hopefully, what I, when I, if I open up and I talk, it'll encourage someone else to open up and talk and they won't suffer like I suffered. And it's not just someone when we talk like young men. We're talking, this can be a struggle for men of all ages to, to talk about issues or struggle with alcohol. Like, there's a lot of people that might watch this and really resonate with it. Yeah, that's the big stigma around men, you know, especially myself. Like, you know, you don't want to say you're struggling because, you know, you're a man, big, strong guy, you can't have issues because it's not a big enough issue for someone to, you know, care about or whatever. And that was the biggest thing that I struggled with. Like, if I asked for help, you know, a few months earlier, or if I was just honest with how I was feeling, and I, maybe I wouldn't have, you know, kept lying to myself and spiralled down this big rabbit hole. Um, and uh, you know, if I can help break some sort of stigma that it's OK to talk, like, I'm OK to talk. It's not, um, if I ask you a question, I'm asking you a question because I care. I'm not asking, asking you to try and trick you into, like, telling me like a deep secret that somehow I'm going to turn it around again. I don't know, that's how I was thinking. Like, you know, your mind just does these weird things. So, yeah, that's what I want to do, mate. Didn't have trust, I guess? Or, no, yeah. no, 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 no way. Didn't trust anyone, paranoia, like, oh, everyone knows, everyone knows kind of thing. It's like your mates really care about you. People, there's so many people around me, and I'm sure there's people out there that think that no one cares when that's the opposite because of the, like, the stories you tell yourself when you're in that, that mind frame. When we talk about support, obviously, when you look over your life, there's been times in your life where you've probably lacked support, right? You've, yeah. you've had a kind of up and down upbringing. Is that fair to say? <laughs> yeah, it's a nice way to summarise yeah. it. Yeah, <laughs> not your, not exactly a um, normal life for myself, which what's normal really, but yeah, up and down. You started. It all started, I guess, for you um, when you were a young fella and you lost your mum yeah. to cancer at a very young age. Um, it's hard to know, but how much did that have an effect on your young life, just growing up? Yeah, it's hard to really know because I was so young and, and everything else. But, you know, since sitting myself a bit more and seeing a lot more therapists since I've started rehabbing or the whole process of this next journey, um, yeah, they, they talk about childhood trauma and, and the effects on the brain and that kind of stuff and the 
and uh, but it's hard for me to be able to summarise how it had affected me. It always it obviously left a big hole in my life, a heart, in my heart from a young age that I sort of just never really learned how to deal with. So I acted out in certain ways, and I was a certain way, and you know that sort of flowed on into my life. But I'm still figuring that out now. Um, still trying to fill that hole with positivity things, you know. That kind of started a, a f an almost nomadic lifestyle for you, right? Like, how many places did you live in mm. when you were a young guy bouncing around? I think I ended up, when I, when I finished my little unsuccessful schooling career, I went to about 11 schools. I went from, when my, my mum passed when I was in Adelaide, I went from Adelaide to Sydney for six months, from Sydney to Darwin, from Darwin to Alice Springs, Alice Springs to Brisbane, Brisbane to the Central Coast, Central Coast to the Northern Beaches, and that's when I started playing for Manly Juniors, and that was a bit of stability. And then obviously, I, I, since then, I moved around a bit for football, but that was my luck. You know, that was my stability as a child, yeah. yeah. How, how difficult was that? I mean, because you're not, you're just living with different people, right? You're living with your dad, you're living with your tennis coach at one point. Yeah. Different places. I didn't even realise at the time I was like, oh, I get to live with my tennis coach. I was like, still like fostered, you know? Like, I live with my tennis coach, I live with another family in between. And I just thought that was like normal. Like, oh, I, I, I get to change, right? Because it was so normal, I just move around. I was living with dad when mum passed, my mum's best friend when my mum passed, and then my aunties after that for a little bit when there was a bit of a custody battle, long story. But, and then my dad again. And then my footy coach, my dad moved away. Tennis coach when that didn't work out. The lady when that didn't work out, this, this family and this lady that put me on. And then they just sort of, yeah, back to my tennis coach, back to my dad when I was 16. <laughs> like, so it just seems, it wasn't that abnormal for me because everything always changed. So um, yeah, it was just a really, really weird life for me. <laughs> it, it's an incredible life in terms of, how do you think that has shaped Liam Knight now, both good and bad? Mm, good. Um, well, I probably learned to adapt to things, to change a bit better than maybe some, because I had so much change. I don't enjoy it, but like, you know, I, can, I can deal with it and things change quick. Um, bad, you know, I sort of probably lost a lot of trust for people in those times where I was, if I think back to what actually happened when I was moving around a lot, you know, I sort of felt safe and secure and then bang, I'm gone. And I'm like, oh, what's happening? Like, I had this, you know, when my mum passed it young, I had this, you know, this random story of like, everyone I loved either leaves or dies. It was really like, you know, embedded in us. It's pretty, you know, I dealt with that a bit, but yeah, it was obviously shaped the way I am towards people. I can be pretty cold and and that kind of stuff, which I'm definitely working on. But yeah, so that's probably played a part in my relationships with people throughout my life, good and bad. You said you moved back in with your dad as a teenager, but that's when you, I mean, probably started to maybe play up a little bit and yeah. get yourself in a little bit of trouble. That's when um, <clears throat> I stopped going to school. I started working. I didn't like school. I, I had some huge authority issues. And um, yeah, school wasn't for me. Uh, and then I started working and I didn't like that. And so I was just bouncing around. But yeah, I started hanging out with some people that were, you know, having fun. And I was like, I really, I love a bit of fun. So that's when I started really playing up. Yeah, and um, got to about 18. And my dad kicked me out of home. I thought he was drinking up one day. And I was just a menace. I came home for a Sunday, a big weekend. Like, I don't know if I was drunk or whatever else. And all my stuff was packed up at the front, at the back door, the door was locked. And I was just like, what's, what do I do now? <laughs> Um, yeah, so that was another interesting moment. And you were just, what, bouncing the couch to couch then? Yeah, like, I was very fortunate. I had some really good mates and I um, stayed on my mate's couch for about a week. Um, stayed with friends um, on and off. I didn't exactly have money ready because I was just, you know, you get it, you spend it, get paid, spend it. So that was where I was living. And then, um, so I lived with a mate for about a year, year and a half. And then, um, you know, playing 20s, working, saving up money. And then I just went to Europe and spent all of it again, and then came back, and my living situation was unlivable at that stage. So once again, I was like, you know, I wasn't on the street, but I was homeless. So I was staying at mates' couches and stuff. It was like, you know, basically part, like, I obviously didn't manage myself that well money-wise, and I just spent what I had, so that was um, a bit of a learning curve. So I stayed on my mates' couch for three weeks, and another mates' couch for about eight weeks. Oh, spare bed, sorry, about eight weeks, and then I finally, you know, started saving and learned the importance of money and, and got my own place and my own furniture, which was the first time I was sort of out my own, on my own two feet. We've spoken 
about the people that have lent you a lot of support in your life, um, especially in those kind of teenage years at Manly when you were coming through, and you've had a strong connection to the Draboyevich family. Yeah. Uh, tell me what those fellas mean to you and, the, and their family as well. Yeah, I like the dad more than both of them, to be honest. Big Johnny, he's an OG. He's a, oh, he's a great bloke, man. Yeah. He's just, he's so much fun to talk to. But yeah, the whole family, the mum, uh, they're just one of the sweetest people like I've ever met, probably. Uh, always so welcoming. Go out of the way, so go out of the way to invite me to dinner, you know, whenever I wanted, sort of thing. Um, but yeah, Tom and Jay, obviously the whole, all the boys, they're just a special family, mate. They're really good people. Do you have a favourite between Tom and Jake? Jake. Yeah, <laughs> Jake. Jake, then Ben, then Luke, then Tom. <laughs> Why does Tom rank last? He was a quite humble kid in 20s, you know, then he started making millions, and now he's a bit of a, you know, he's just changed a lot. <laughs> What's it like, though, I guess, to have a better control on that now, money, and just when you look back at the way you probably lived your life, it was... Yeah, <laughs> it's stable, it's a lot more stable, but barring that little period. Um, you know, little moments here and there. But especially now, I feel like I'm probably in the best place I've ever been in, mentally, physically. Main reason, I think, for me is just cutting out that, that party scene that doesn't work for me. Because, you know, if I look back to all the instabilities, you know, besides childhood stuff, you know, I wasn't exactly drinking, but it all sort of stemmed my behaviour, all, all my troubles or everything that was going wrong sort of came from being drunk, partying scene. So, like, you know, I was always acting out. I was always drunk. Or I was getting in trouble when I drink driving, I was obviously drunk and I was trying to fit in and, and trying to be the man or whatever else it was. It was all alcohol. Like, if I look back at it, uh, very rarely have I can remember, like, really stuffing up in life or getting myself into a jam sober. So, like, what works for me is being sober. And what doesn't is that. So that was a pretty... Another big decision for me, like, yeah. you know, another little bearing. You talk about the, the drink driving charge, obviously, Infamous at the time, and but I mean, when you look back on it now, do you, th you got lucky in a way. You got lucky in a, in a lot of ways. That could have been a lot worse. Yeah, I obviously didn't kill anyone, didn't kill myself, didn't crash. That was very lucky. Um, I didn't get sacked, which was pretty incredible, since like the way I was sort of the way I did it, I wasn't exactly like mid range or whatever. Um, and then, you know, I worked really hard after that. And that whole year was just a weird one, you know. I did, yeah, drink driving and then didn't get sacked. I got suspended. Came back, ended up making my NRL debut that year. So it was just a weird year, that one. Yeah. I did break my foot in the first 30 seconds, but... <laughs> things happen. Still exciting. Shit you know, happens. For a little bit. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but then, but it, I mean, it all quickly changed then, right? Suddenly you signed a deal with the Roosters a couple of years and everything, like... Looked up. Yeah, at the time, I was yeah. like, wow, I'm killing it, you know? Yeah. I'm, I don't know, what's like 21? I was like, just on a three-year deal, pretty good coin, you know, for my, like, the best coin I've seen in my life. And I went to my head pretty quick, you know, as a young kid, you know, all your mates, you need know, normal jobs, and you're like, you start thinking, like, oh, I'm pretty I'm pretty good here, you know? You start telling, you pump yourself up. You didn't have it, you know, I'd probably design my life. I didn't have anyone around me that I could, like, I would really take on their opinion of, like, maybe calm down or, like, you know? Ground yourself, I was just like, oh, I'm the man. I'm the man. And everything that worked for me to get me, you know, in that sort of successful place was dropped and my habits dropped and then I started partying again and, and everything went to shit pretty quick, you know, like my attitude changed and my training and my priorities switched. And then six months, seven months, you know, that was when Robbo sort of sat me down and said, there's no future for this club. And I just once I just didn't know how that was, like, what happened. Blinking it and it, just, it was gone, you know? Mainly just the choices I was making on weekends. It was a pretty harsh conversation, right? He, he didn't sugarcoat it for you. No, he didn't. <laughs> and I was like, at the time, I was like, how did I, I walked out of there confused? Like, what have I done wrong? What do you say? I, I don't trust you. Is that what don't you trust said? you, yeah, yeah. Like, I don't trust you, and there's no future for you at this club, but, you know, in your best interest to find another club, kind of thing. And I said it with a straight face, and I was sort of like, I was about to laugh. I thought he was like, I was waiting for him to start, nah, I'm just joking. Like, well, good mate. And I was just like, Oh, uh, okay. Uh, <laughs> like, cheers, thanks for your honesty, and then walked out like, like I saw a ghost. <laughs> I was like, what do I do now? What happened after that conversation? How did you end up in Canberra? Uh, I got a call from John Bonacera. He was the he was the Canberra team manager, I think, at the time. And he said, "Hey, mate, um, would you be open to coming to talk to Ricky in Canberra for the you know for a few hours? Meet at the airport. You just fly in, fly out." And I went, 
I don't really want to go, in my head, thinking, like, I don't really want to go to Canberra. It's not really for me. I'm a beach. I like near being in the beach. But I'll have a conversation, you know. I don't want to say no to Ricky. I'll go meet him out of respect and see what he has to say. <clears throat> um, so I went to see him, like, you know, fly in, met him at the airport in some little back room, had a chat, really liked what he had to say. And then um, three days later, I was in Canberra. It's a bit of a shock, isn't it? Like, you... So I imagine there was a point where you're sitting in Canberra going, I'm Mate. supposed to beat the Roosters. This, this yeah. is not how it was all supposed to go. Yeah, you know, and not, like, not that long ago before that, I was at like Manly, which I love, you know, junior club, Roosters, oh, you know, I'm killing it. Roosters a premier club in the NRL. I'm sitting in the hotel room, it's minus six degrees outside, and I'm just like, how did I get here? Like, nothing, you know, like, I was really grateful to get the opportunity at Canberra, but I was like, from where I was at, Northern Beaches, east, near the eastern suburbs, you know, like, what happened? And then probably pointed the finger a lot, you know, like it was, you know, oh, his fault, he didn't, this, that, you know, it was not me, and then sat with that for a bit until I realised like, I was obviously the big problem. So your time in Canberra, then, how did that roll into South Sydney? Um, well, I, I sort of obviously put myself in a better position to play first grade, and I did get that little taste, and I and I connected better with the boys. The boys there were like honestly such a like, such a good bunch of blokes, and the club was professional. I was a bit homesick, like not exactly a family in Sydney, but like I just missed the beach, and I was driving back all the time, see mates and stuff like that. I said to my manager, I had another year on my contract at Canberra, and I just said, like, please, can we get back, get me back to Sydney? And I almost landed at a few clubs before Souths. I was like, I, pretty, I was pretty sure I was going to go to Para, and I was like, you know, I was excited, whatever else. Didn't happen. Penrith was pretty much a sure thing at one stage almost, and then that didn't happen, and I went like, <laughs> bang, South came out of a sort of nowhere. And then, yeah, not long after that, I was at, I was at South. Do you remember the first phone call you got from Uncle Wayne Bennett? when he brought you to the Rabbitohs? Yeah, I do. I was um, driving, I think I was driving back to Sydney from Canberra, and I get this random number pop up on my phone that I haven't saved, and I obviously answered it, like, oh, hello, hello, Liam speaking. He's like, hey, mate, it's Wayne Bennett. Or well, mine says Wayne. And I said, no, it's not, I hung up on him. And he called me back, and he's like, mate, it is, it's actually Wayne Bennett. And I went, oh, oh, so hey, mate, how you going? Sorry about that, I thought it was a prank call, and then we had a little chat, you know, I can't remember what we talked about, more or less about coming to South and opportunity and, you know, who, who was there and stuff like that, so... That was my first introduction to the way a minute. And he was, he was really good to you, right? Like, he wanted to wipe the slate clean. Yeah, the first conversation we had in person was at Redfern, and he sort of just said to me, I don't care about what you've been up to, what you've done prior to this club, what happens, what, it, what matters to me is what happens next and how you adapt or you don't adapt, you know? You're either here or you're not. It's pretty simple. You either buy in or you'll probably be pushed out. And that was my first big sort of wake-up call and I was, you know, ever since then we developed a really good relationship. Well, what is it about uh, Wayne? You know, everyone talks about his presence and his sense of humour. Do you have a, a good little Wayne Bennett story that you, comes to mind when you think of him? Um, when we got beat by Penrith by about 40 points, a dubbo, well, obviously, everyone was pretty down in the dumps, and we come to training, and it wanes us. Oh, we changed up from the team meeting room. Everyone in the gym want to show you something. He comes in the gym, puts some music on, gets his shirt off, and starts walking around like the gym like that. Like, everyone's like, whoa, everyone's just like loving it, like, you know, cheering for him. And he goes, boys, I don't do sad. I don't want any whinging. I don't care. That game's done. We're going with what happens next. And that year, we went on to make the grand final. Obviously, I wasn't a part of it, but well, we went on to make the grand final. Pretty, like, you get beat by 50 points, everyone writes you off. You get your head coach, who's like, you know, one of the most respected men in rugby league, getting his kid off just to have a laugh, just to reset and go again. That's like just Wayne Bennett, who he is. 